This video is aimed at helping students with Math Skill M1.9, which is the one that says you should be able to select and use the correct statistical test when you're analysing and evaluating data given. In this case, specifically the student's t-test. In this first example, testing for the significance of correlation between two sets of data means that you've collected two sets of quantitative data and want to look to see if there is a link between the two. Does an increase in one cause an increase or decrease in the second set of data? At a lower level, you might have looked at graphs like this and when you have a scattergram that you can roughly draw a line of best fit on, you use that as the basis to say if there's positive correlation, negative correlation or no correlation. What statistics allows you to do is put a value on just how much of a correlation there is and then compare it with a critical value to say is this correlation actually significant or not. This kind of data would be analysed using a Spearman's rank test. The third example looks for the significance of associations between categorical data. So if you have a spread of data in amongst different categories, it's trying to identify whether there's a significant reason why one of those categories might have a higher frequency than the others. Again, you would need to calculate a statistical test and then compare it with a critical value to see if there was a significant difference or not. This is done using the chi-squared test. For the last test, for the significance of difference between two values or means, where you are comparing two means and one is higher than the other, could that difference just be due to chance or is it due to a significant reason? This final test is what we mean by student's t-test. These are the formulae given for the unpaired and paired t-test in the OCR Biology A specification. Different examples might have slightly different versions of this formula, but these are the ones that we're going to cover. Now, just to reassure you, the statistics equations for the main three stats tests, chi-squared, Spearman's rank and t-test will always be given to you. You don't need to know these formulae off by heart, but you should be able to use them. For in each case, whether it's paired or unpaired, you will need to be able to calculate standard deviation and then use that standard deviation to help you calculate the actual t-value as well. If we use the unpaired first, the x is the data that you are actually using. It's a data point that you've collected. X with a bar above it means the mean of the data for that particular set. N is how many repeats you actually had. This epsilon symbol means the sum of. So for each data point that you've collected, you need to take that data, subtract it from the mean of that data, and then square it. And then you do that for all of your data points, i.e. all of your repeats for that category, and then add them all up before you divide it by n minus 1. And then you square root the whole thing. That's for standard deviation. This is the mean of your first set of data. This is the mean of your second set of data. The S is the standard deviation squared of your first set of data. This S is the standard deviation of your second set of data. This N is how many repeats you had for your first set of data. That is the number of repeats you had for the second set of data. It basically means that you can carry out this calculation even if you had different numbers of repeats for each of the different categories that you were investigating. The unpaired t-test is done when you are comparing the means of two sets of data which aren't directly related to one another. For example, a separate field has one fertilizer applied and you record the average growth, growth rate. A second field has um, a different fertilizer applied and you record a second average growth rate and you want to compare those two. One field doesn't have anything directly to do with the other. Linked to that example, you would use the paired t-test if on the same field you recorded the average growth rate and then to that same field, you then applied a fertilizer so that you can compare the average growth rate before and after. 
Now that's when you do the paired t-test because both sets of data that you recorded before and after have been done linked to the same individuals. Now this means that when you do the standard deviation, you're not doing the standard deviation of all the growth rates. What you're doing the standard deviation of is the difference, that's what the D stands for, the difference between the growth rate before and the growth rate after for each of your repeats. So when you do the t-test for the paired t-test, this is the average of the differences. That's how many pairs of data you had, and that's the standard deviation of your differences. To help with your understanding, you should always try and go through worked examples. In this case, as the video is playing, pause at regular intervals to try and do the calculation yourself and then continue playing to see if you have the correct answer. In this example, scientists collected data on the mass of eight adults who normally eat a junk food diet and eight adults who normally eat a healthy food diet. I.e. they've recorded data for eight different people who followed the junk food diet and eight different people who followed a healthy food diet. That means we've got two distinct categories. The people in one group has nothing to do with the people in the other group. That means this one, if you were going to do the uh, t-test, would be the unpaired t-test. At GCSE, these are the kind of questions you might get asked about data like this. What hypothesis are they testing? Well, they appear to be looking for if there's a difference between the average mass of someone who follows the junk food diet and somebody who follows the healthy food diet. You'd be expected to identify the independent and dependent variable and consider if they're trying to compare the difference of a diet on two different groups of people, what other variables should they try and control to make sure that only the diet is making a difference to their dependent variable and not anything else. And then you might be expected to draw a conclusion. At key stage three or key stage four, this is how that data might be presented. Higher level GCSE might ask you to plot some range bars showing just how much of a difference there is between all the people who contributed to these means. But it would be enough to say that people who follow the junk food diet appear to have a higher mean mass than people who follow a healthy food diet. At A level, what we're saying is, yes, that is what it looks like. But is that difference statistically significant or could it just have happened due to chance just because of which individuals you happened to choose? In order to find out if it's statistically significant or not, you need to do a stats test. And in this case, you need to do the t-test. Take a moment to try and calculate the standard deviation of the data for the junk food and the data for the healthy food before you move on. Hopefully, these are the values that you should have calculated. And you might have realised that these are very high standard deviation values. That in the data that was collected, there is a massive difference between all of the repeats that contributed to that mean, which suggests that this data isn't actually that repeatable. On this slide now, although the values are identical, when you look at the description, you can see that the information collected is actually completely different. This time it says, eight adults who normally eat a junk food diet agreed to follow a healthy diet for two months. The table gives their mass immediately before and after the two month period. This means they took the mass of eight different people before they changed the diet and then following a two month period, took the mass again of the same eight people after the two month period. That means that this data is paired because you've taken two sets of data for the same individuals. This one means you are now going to do the paired t-test. Just looking at the numbers, the mean is the same, 70.9 for before, 67.6 kilograms for after. But this time the data means something completely different. What it's saying is that following a two month period of changing the diet, the average mass of each individual appears to have gone down on average. Again, initially the data can be used and, uh, to plot a bar chart, such as the one on the screen, one showing before and one showing after. The question again is, is the drop in the average mass significant or could it just be due to chance? 
This means that we are not just doing the t-test on the average of the data collected before and the data collected after. The data is paired, so we need to work out the difference for each individual first, i.e. has their mass gone up or has it gone down? In each case, you can see that this person's mass has gone down, this person's has gone down, this one's actually gone up, but just a tiny bit. This one's come down just a little bit. This one's come down by a lot and so on. So on average, is there a statistically significant difference between the mass before and the mass after? For this, we need to do the calculation for the paired standard deviation on difference and then the paired t-test. Using the paired t-test formulae then, Take a few minutes to actually calculate that for yourselves first. Hopefully the values you have are a standard deviation of the differences of 3.9 and a paired t-test value of 2.32. That number by itself doesn't tell us anything. We need to compare it with a critical value to see if it's actually significant or not. In order to find the correct critical value to compare our t-test answer with, we first need to establish what the degrees of freedom are. If you have done a paired t-test, we've taken both sets of data from the same individual. That means that you look at however many pairs of data or individuals you actually have. In our case, we had eight individuals that we were measuring the mass for and take away one. If we'd done the unpaired test, so, for example, in our very first set of data, we said there were eight different people who had their mass following a junk food diet and a different eight people with their mass following a healthy food diet. In that case, there would be 16 different total samples and you take away two. This is the version that we're actually going to use because our data is paired. So eight individuals minus one means our degrees of freedom that we're looking for is seven. You don't need to have memorized the values in a critical value table such as this, but you should be able to find the right one that you want. Degrees of freedom we've just established is seven. So we're looking at this row. We say that you can never be 100% sure of anything. In biology, unless told otherwise, we look for a 95% confidence level, i.e. is there a less than 5% probability that our results were due to chance? If yes, then we can be more than 95% confident that this difference is significant. And so this is the column heading that we're looking for, which means our critical value is t-test value is greater than the critical value at 5% probability, then our results are significant and there is a statistical difference between the mass before the diet change and the mass after the diet change. In this case, 2.32 is less than the critical value, which means that there is no significant difference between the mass before and the mass after at the 95% confidence level. As an extra though, it's worth considering that our value of 2.32 is greater than the critical value at a 10% probability, i.e. we can't be 95% confident that our difference is significant, but we could be 90% confident that the mass after a healthy food is going to be lower than the mass before the healthy food diet. Here's another example. Does the pH of soil affect seed germination of a specific plant species? Two pots of seeds were planted, one with soil at pH 5.5 and one with soil at pH 7.0. 50 seeds were planted in each pot and the number that germinated in each pot was recorded. Eight different pots at pH 5.5, a different eight pots at pH 7.0. So we have two sets of data that are not directly related to each other. That means that this time, this is going to be 
following the unpaired t-test formulae. This time we're using these two sets of formulae, the first one to work out the standard deviation of each set of data, so the standard deviation of the pots at the acidic pH and the standard deviation of the pots at the higher pH, and then you use the second formula to work out the unpaired t-test. Laying out the data like this with different columns for each stage of the calculation often helps with making sure that you haven't missed a step. So you add a column to look at the data minus the mean, which means you have to have calculated the mean first and then square it. And then we're going to need to do the sum of all of that. So you add that at the bottom. Take a few minutes to calculate the standard deviation for each set of data. The workings out that you use should mean that these are the kind of values you are putting into that equation for standard deviation. So the standard deviation for group 1 should be 2.36 and the standard deviation for group 2 should be 3.42. These are then the values you should be able to put into the unpaired t-test formula. So your final answer should be minus 3.12. In the case of standard deviation, don't worry about the minus sign. That minus is going to be there or not there, depending on which set of data you used for A and which set of data you used for B. So it doesn't really matter. It's the value itself that you're going to be comparing with the critical value. Once again, remember that to find the correct critical value, we need to know what our degrees of freedom are. In this case, there were eight pots in group one, eight pots in group two, so a total of 16 sets of data. And because the data is unpaired, we do 16 minus two to find the degrees of freedom. Remember, if our answer for the t-test is lower than the critical value, then you accept the null hypothesis, i.e. there is no significant difference between how many seeds germinate at the two different pHs. In this case, our t-test value of 3.12 is much higher than the critical value at 2.15. So because our value is greater, then our value is significant. So we reject the null hypothesis and we can say that there is a significant difference between the two means, i.e. pH does make a difference to the germination rate for this plant. At this point, it's worth considering that if you're doing A-level maths, this might be a little bit confusing. Some students have said that at A-level maths, they do the opposite, that they calculate a stats test and if their value is higher than the value in the table then their value doesn't matter that's because in maths their tables are not tables of critical values their tables are tables of significance levels so in biology if your answer is bigger than the critical value this means that your answer is significant so in that case you can reject the null hypothesis I hope this video has helped to improve your understanding of how and when to use the student's t-test. If in doubt, number one, work through these examples yourself step by step, comparing your answers with what's in the video to make sure that you're doing the formula correctly. If you're still having any problems, remember you can always come back to a member of staff if you have any questions at all.